Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? What an important subject we have today, World War III. Now the question is not, is there going to be a World War III? It's in your Bible. There's not a one-tenth of one percent chance that it's not going to happen. Another world war is coming, and it's going to be the biggest world war ever. Now, just so that you can see for yourself the prophecy, let's take a look at it right now. It's found in Revelation chapter number 9, verse number 15. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of all the people on earth. I'll never forget when I really focused on this for the first time, I said, wait, one third? Of all the people on the earth, that's incredible. I mean, when you talk about one third of the entire human race, I thought, surely not. Maybe I should go to the Greek and see what it really has to say. So that's what I did. Uh, I went to several different translations. The King James Version said to slay the third part of men. The New King James Version said to kill a third of mankind. The Good News translation, to kill a third of the human race. And then the New Living translation, to kill one third of all the people on earth. I checked 15 or 20 different translations. And by the time I was done, I concluded that the Bible said exactly what it meant. That I was looking at a prophecy that there was going to be one third of this human race wiped out in a war that was coming. Well, in order for us to really understand this, let's put this in perspective for just a moment. Prior to the 20th century, there had never been one war with one million fatalities. Then came World War I, 1914 to 1918. 8.2 million dead. They called it the Great War. They called it World War I. They said this can never happen again. I mean, 6,000 years and not one war with one million fatalities, and suddenly we have this horrific war, 8.2 million dead. Well, they established the League of Nations hoping to prevent anything like this from ever happening again. So what happened? 20 years later, World War II, this time they didn't have 8.2 million dead. This time, 52 million people dead. And it's like something had come unhinged in the human soul. How can we ever stop this? And then we founded the United Nations, and we hope today that we have this fixed. But I have the very bad assignment of telling you it's not fixed. There's another war coming, and this one won't be 8 million dead. This will not be 52 million dead. This war that's coming is going to be 2.2 billion. I'm talking about 40 times World War II, the worst war ever. Now, I can't tell you exactly when this is going to happen. I think it could happen yet this year. And you're going to see as we go along in this message, you're going to see what the Bible says. There's a whole lot more information about this war than we've talked about so far. But this we know. Now, let's look at it just to make sure we really get it. I'm talking about 6,000 years of human history and not one war with one million dead. Then we reach 1914. 8.2 million dead. Then 1939 through 1945, 
52 million dead. The next World War, World War III, will be 2.2 billion. It's like it's going through the roof. In this time when mankind is more educated than he's ever been, when the knowledge base is multiplying, doubling every two years, it seems like the only thing we're getting smarter at is killing people. I mean, the divorce rates are up, the suicide rates are up, the jails are fuller than they've ever been. The only thing we're getting better at is killing people. It's a very serious time in the history of the human race. Now, the Bible tells us where World War III will begin from. Back to Revelation 9. Now, this is the sixth trumpet prophecy. And starting with verse number 13, listen to it. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. What are we talking about? The Euphrates River. The Euphrates River is over in the Middle East, and these angels were bound in the Euphrates River. Now, angels are spirits. The Bible tells us that angels are ministering spirits to us who are the heirs of salvation. But these angels are not good angels. You know that one-third of the angels rebelled with Satan. And so one-third of the angels are evil angels. Well, these are part of those evil angels. How do we know for sure? Because they're bound in the great river Euphrates. But when they are loosed, their assignment is to kill one-third of mankind. Now let's look at where the Euphrates uh, River actually is. The Euphrates River starts in Turkey up in the north. It then comes down through Syria. Uh, it enters the northern boundary of Iraq. 60 to 70 percent of the Euphrates River is in Iraq which is where we have troop station at this moment. War has been raging up and down the Euphrates River since 2003, since we invaded Iraq. Then finally the Euphrates River empties into the Persian Gulf. Now the Bible says that that's where World War III will emanate from. Now if that's true, it appears that it's probably on the brink of starting if it hasn't already started. Now let's take a look at the map here. You can see it on your screen. The yellow line, notice, starts in Turkey in the north, down through Syria, then through Iraq, and comes within about 50 miles of Iran. So we've got the conflict with Iran brewing. We have the war continuing in Iraq, even though they're trying to tell us it's about over. There's still bombings going on there every day. And then all the way up through this area, you've got Afghanistan, you've got Pakistan. The Bible prophesies that World War III will begin from this area of the world. Now, it probably will not be contained there because to kill two billion people, you've got got to reach a large part of the world. There's a total of 6.8 billion people. Now the question is, who will be involved in this war? Well, we know that Mao Zedong, the late leader of China, boasted in his diary that he could field an army of 200 million. Now verse number 16 of this prophecy says, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. This is pretty incredible that this godless atheist man would just so happen to say the very number that's in this 16th verse of this ninth chapter of the book of Revelation. He says we can field 200 million soldiers. The Bible says that's the number of the horsemen. So does that mean then that China is going to be one of the participants in this war? I think it's highly likely, but you can't nail that down for sure because there are at least two other entities on this planet right now that could actually also field 200 million soldiers. Uh, we know that the Islamic world has a population of 1.5 billion. The population of China is about 1.3. So the Islamic world, if they got together and begin to fight together, they could field an army of 200 million. India now has about 1.1 billion in population, and so India 
could possibly put that many soldiers on the battlefield, even though India doesn't appear to be as engaged in world affairs as the Islamic faction and as China may be. Now, we can't skip over the Islamic faction because the Bible says this war emanates from the Euphrates River. And 100%, every inch of the Euphrates River is controlled by Islamic nations right now. So who will be involved in the war? Well, the United States almost for sure will be involved since we right today have 145,000 troops fighting up and down the Euphrates River. Beyond this, the United States of America has the nuclear firepower to kill 2.2 billion people. It takes a lot of armaments to slay 2.2 billion. I mean, the biggest war we've ever had on this planet is 52 million. We're talking about 40 times World War II. It's definitely going to be nuclear. There's no doubt in my mind about it. Now, the next thing we'd like to know is, well, so when will World War Three happen? Do we have a time frame? Actually, the scripture tells us when it's going to happen. It has to happen sometime before the Great Tribulation. Now, the Great Tribulation begins three and one half years before the Battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people say, well, I thought the Great Tribulation was seven years before the Battle of Armageddon, but that's a mistaken notion. Let me give you the scriptures because some of you may be interested, uh, especially if you've all your life believed that the Great Tribulation was going to be seven years. Let me give you the scriptures that explicitly tell us the Great Tribulation will be three and a half years. Now, if you want a seven-year tribulation, I suppose you can have it, but uh, the Bible teaches it will last for three and a half years, and believe me, that's going to be long enough. The Scriptures are these. Daniel 7, 25, the little horn, the Antichrist, makes war against the saints for time, times, and half a time. A time is one year, times is two years, a half time is half a year. How do I know that? Because another prophecy says the exact same thing, only states the time a different way. Revelation chapter 13 verse 5 says about the Antichrist, and power was given unto the beast to continue 42 months, and he makes war against the saints and prevails against them. So in Daniel 7, 25, it says time, times, and half a time. In Revelation 13, 5, it says 42 months. Well, then in Revelation 12 and 6, it says the dragon makes war against the woman Israel for 1,260 days. Divide it up. 1,260 days is three and a half years. And every time we see a time period put on the Great Tribulation, it's three and a half years. Even Jesus spoke of the abomination of desolation. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then let those which be in Judea flee, because then shall be great tribulation, such as never has been before, nor ever again shall be. So Jesus said the great tribulation would begin at the abomination of desolation, and Daniel taught in Daniel 9, 27, that the abomination of desolation happens halfway through that final seven-year period. So every single place where we see the time of the great tribulation, it says it's three and one half years. Now, there is a seven year period, but the first half of that seven year period is not tribulation at all. It's the buildup to the final three and a half years called the Great Tribulation. Okay, now, how do we know, though, that this war has to happen before the Great Tribulation begins? Well, we know this because the prophecy about the Six Trumpet War is given in Revelation chapter number 9, verse 13 through 20. Then you move into Revelation chapter number 10, and it tells about the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Let's actually go there now. Let's look at Revelation chapter number 10, verse 1. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head and his face was like the sun and his feet were like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand 
and he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. Now we're going to see this twice in the Bible and both times it indicates that this is the event that marks the great tribulation. Continuing on down to verse number five, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it and the earth and the things that are in it and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. Now your King James Version probably says there shall be time no more. We know that that's not the accurate translation because we know immediately you move into chapter 11, it starts talking about another three and a half years. And then later on in the book of Revelation, it talks about another 1,000 years. So when it says there should be uh, time no more, the new king, King James Version says there shall be delay no longer. And all the translations agree with that. It's simply saying we have reached the crossroads. We have reached the turning point. So after you see this, you see the next thing in Revelation chapter 11, you see a prophecy about measuring the temple and saying that the temple will be trodden down the Gentiles for the next 42 months. So it gives us a time frame. You have this angel standing one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, declaring that delay shall be no longer. And then immediately we move into the final 42 months. And in verse number three of Revelation 11, it says that the two witnesses of God begin their ministry for 1,260 days. So both of these passages indicate from the time Time the angel stands one foot on the land and one foot on the sea, that that begins the final three and a half years. And we know that's the Great Tribulation. So you have the Sixth Trumpet War, World War III, in chapter number nine. You have the beginning of the Great Tribulation in chapter number 10. Then you have the final three and a half years in chapter 11. And chapter 11 culminates with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the last trump. And verse 15 says that the kingdoms of this world are now become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. Now, this event is also recorded in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter number 12. And I want you to notice carefully the similarities here. Verse 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, speaking to Daniel and thy people Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. He's talking about the great tribulation. When Jesus described the great tribulation, he said, then shall be great tribulation such as never was before, nor ever again shall be. Well, that's the same thing here. Daniel is describing a time of trouble such as never never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. And at that time, that thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. So Daniel's talking about the great tribulation. Now, as we go on down in verse number six of this same 12th chapter, he continues on. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? You just told me about the great tribulation beginning. How long will it be? And I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the rivers. And when he held up his right hand, now here he stands on the waters again. Again, he holds up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever. This is the exact same event as is in Revelation chapter number 10. He swears by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time and times and half a time. Three and a half years. That's that terminology again. So both in Daniel chapter number 12 and in Revelation chapter number 10, it says the exact same thing. And when he shall have accomplished, when the Antichrist shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, how long till the end of these wonders? Time, times, and half a time. Three and one half years. So what do we see here? We are seeing then that this war will begin in Revelation chapter number nine. It will kill one third of the human race. Then the great tribulation will begin. Now we don't know how far before the great tribulation this war has to happen. Could it happen two years before the great tribulation begins or Four years or five years, that's not given to us. However, we can have an understanding 
of about how these events are going to fall. Now, let's, took, let's take a quick look right now of the likely order of prophetic fulfillments because I've been talking about a lot of things that may not be totally familiar to you. So let's just quickly look at the timeline of events and how, how all these things are going to, going to unfold. We know that the sixth trumpet war happens. And then either just before that or just after that, there will be a peace agreement in the Middle East. The Bible calls this the confirmation of the covenant. When the peace agreement takes place, which clears the way for the final borders of Israel to be established and the temple mount to be placed under international control, opening the way for a temple to be built. When that happens, we know that marks the beginning of the final seven years to the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth. So we've got the sixth trumpet war. We've got the international peace for the Middle East is confirmed. And then shortly after that, within three and a half years, the Jewish temple will be built. And it looks like it will happen within that three and a half year period. The Bible says in two or three different places specifically that Israel will build her temple on the Temple Mount. So the temple will be rebuilt. Now, once the temple is built, the Jewish people will begin animal sacrifices again. And when they start these animal sacrifices, this is going to be bad news to the animal rights activists and to the different people that are opposed to that. And so there's going to be a lot of problems that will be entailed by these developments all happening in the land of Israel. These things, I'm not telling you these things may happen. The Bible specifically prophesies that these things are going to happen. So the sacrifices will be instituted. And then because of all the uproar created, the Bible teaches the Antichrist will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to stop. He will cause the daily sacrifice to cease. And this is prophesied at least three times in your Bible. Then... He not only will cause the sacrifice to cease, but he will assert his authority on the Temple Mount. By this time, the Temple Mount will be placed under an international control, which already is being proposed by the U.S. government right now. They have already said the way to solve the argument over the control of Jerusalem and the control of the Temple Mount is to place it under international control. Well, that's apparently going to happen because in the middle of all of this chaos and conflict, the Bible says that the Antichrist will stand on the Temple Mount and say, I am in charge here. I'm the ultimate authority here. Now, the Bible has a special name for this event called the abomination of desolation because Almighty God said he would place his name in Jerusalem and on the Temple Mount. And when the Antichrist stands there usurping the place of the real Christ. And when Satan inserts himself in the place of Almighty God, the Bible repeatedly calls this event the abomination of desolation. And the Bible says that the abomination of desolation, that's when the Antichrist will be revealed, not to the whole world. Most of the world will never know he's the Antichrist. But to those people who walk with God, who understand the prophecies of the Bible, they will know, okay, there's your Antichrist. That's the one world leader that's going to perpetrate the great tribulation on this world. Now, when the abomination of desolation occurs, remember what Jesus said. When you see the abomination of desolation, then shall be great tribulation such as never has been before, nor ever again shall be. Now, when the great tribulation begins, that's when the mark of the beast is going to be instituted. That's when every person on earth will be forced to pledge allegiance to the Antichrist and its one world government system. System, and that's when everybody's going to have to have a mark or a number that they will need in order to be able to buy or to sell. Well, that's going to go on for three and a half years, the great tribulation period, the reign of the Antichrist. Remember Revelation chapter 13, 5, power was given unto the beast to continue 40 and two months and all of it will finally culminate at the battle of Armageddon. Now, we've done an overview here of the prophecies and how all this fits in. Now, in the next segment of World War III, we'll discover who will participate in this war. I'm interested in that. And what will the world look like after one-third of mankind is destroyed? 
when 2.2 billion people die. I mean, they're going to be burying them with bulldozers. And after that, what's going to happen? We'll also know which nations are going to be key players in the one world government of the Antichrist. The Bible actually tells us this. And in the next segment of World War III, you're going to see it straight from the Bible. It'll tell us which nations are actually going to participate in this one world governmental system. Now, what may be even more important, we're also going to learn what's going to happen to the United States of America and what's going to happen to the nation of Israel. What's the reign of the Antichrist going to be like? Is he going to be so powerful that anybody that raises their eyebrow against him will be squashed like a bug? How's this going to affect you? How's it going to affect me? All of this is revealed in the second part of this incredible prophecy. I'm talking about World War III. Is it coming? Absolutely. Can it be stopped? No way. It's prophesied in your Bible. So then what should we do? We're going to talk about that too because it's important for you and me to know exactly what we should be doing. Now, this is critical information for all of us. So whatever you do, don't miss the next segment of World War III. In this segment of World War III, we're going to learn what the world will be like after one-third of mankind, 2.2 billion people, are killed. We're also going to discover what happens to the United States and the nation of Israel after this war. We also will learn who the key participants in the government of the Antichrist will be. So this is going to be an incredibly important lesson. Now, in order for us to follow along, let's review quickly what we learned in the last segment about the order of end time events. We're going to go through this real quickly here. We know the sixth trumpet war is coming. About that time, an international peace for the Middle East will be confirmed. The temple, the Jewish temple, will be built on the Temple Mount beside the Dome of the Rock. The Temple Mount will be shared. Sacrifices in this new Jewish temple will be instituted. Then the sacrifices will be stopped by the Antichrist. He will then stand on the Temple Mount saying, I am the ultimate authority here. The Bible even says he'll exalt himself above all that is called God or that, or that is worship. And that will be what's called the abomination of desolation. The Bible also says that's the revelation of the Antichrist. That's the way that the people who understand the prophecies will know for sure who he is. That also begins the final three and one half years called the Great Tribulation. Now, during this final three and a half years that the mark of the beast will be instituted, this is going to be a mark or a number that every person will be forced to take or else they will not be allowed to buy or sell, which probably means they won't be allowed to have a job. They won't be able to participate in the economy and they'll have to pledge their allegiance to this one world government and the leader of the one world government, the Antichrist, in order to get their mark or number. So this is going to be the ultimate control mechanism. At the end of the three and a half years, the world governmental system will try to invade the nation of Israel, triggering the battle of Armageddon. Of course, it's at Armageddon that Jesus Christ returns to the earth, fights against the world government armies, puts them down, and establishes his kingdom, a kingdom that will never pass away, never be destroyed. Now, I want to talk about something that is very important. Uh, we want to know whether World War III will happen before the peace agreement in the Middle East or after. We know that the Bible gives us a prophecy with a date on it. And this prophecy is that there will be the confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant, that there will be a peace agreement between the international community and Israel, probably participated in by the Palestinians, and that when this is concluded, it will place the Temple Mount under a sharing arrangement, placing it under international control. When that agreement is concluded, the Bible says there's seven years left to the Battle of Armageddon. Now, the big question is, so will this war that kills one-third of mankind, World War III I'm talking about right now, will this war happen before the peace agreement 
or after the peace agreement. Now, I think it's the war is going to happen before because it's hard for me to imagine that we're seeing 2.2 billion people slaughtered at the same time there's a peace agreement and they're building their third temple in Israel. So I suspect that this war is going to happen uh, just before all that occurs. And then in the wake of that war, there's going to be such an incredible cry. Can you imagine 2.2 billion people dead and there's such an incredible cry for peace on earth that then the Middle East peace will be ushered right in. I can see already the leaders of the world say, I don't care what any of you say, we've had enough of this nonsense. We're going to destroy everything on earth if we ever do this again and we're going to make peace whether you like it or whether you don't. And all of a sudden the Antichrist, he comes to power on this entrance ramp of 2.2 billion dead. He's a man with answers. He takes the bull by the horns and most of the world is going to think it's a wonderful thing. Let's talk about for a moment what's going to start this war. Could it be another terror attack on the U.S.? Maybe that will start the war. We know there are rumors right now that Israel may attack Iran. Iran is moving to develop nuclear technology. Israel knows that one bomb on the nation of Israel will destroy the nation. And the president of Iran has been repeatedly saying that Israel is going to be wiped off the map. And so Israel's thinking, should we attack? Should we not? And there have been some people that have said the United States should do it for Israel. The international community seems to be uh, unable, impotent to do anything about it. Uh, there's actually a quote that was carried in the Jerusalem Post back in August the 30th of 2008. And this was a statement by the deputy chief of staff of Iran. He said, should Israel or the United States attack Iran, it would be the start of another world war. So maybe that will be the start. We do not know today exactly what will trigger the beginning of World War III, but it's coming. Now, there are some people, I'm talking about noted historians that say we're already in this war. Mr. James Woolsey, the director of the CIA under the President Clinton administration, he said he believed that World War III began on 9-1-1 with the attack on the Twin Towers. Now, Thomas Friedman, the famous columnist for the New York Times, he believes the same thing. Newt Gingrich, former Speaker of the House, he says World War III began on 9-1-1 and they're just not telling our world what's really going on right now because that launched the war on terrorism. Well, where does that stop? We're finding out that the more we fight terrorism, the more terrorism we have. And, you know, President Bush said that it might be a 30-year war. It's like they know what they're doing. Uh, and finally, President Bush himself said on May the 6th of 2006, the revolt on Flight 93 by the passenger was the first counterattack to World War III. So even President George W. Bush stated that World War III actually did begin on uh, 9 one one Now, the conflict that's going to be triggered whenever this happens, we know it will engulf the whole world. You have to. You don't kill 2.2 billion human beings without a world war and it will be nuclear. The only way you can kill that many people, the nuclear buttons are going to be pushed. The nuclear weapons are going to fly. But our next big question is, so how does the war end up? How long will it take? I don't know. Uh, once nuclear weapons start flying, whole nations will be wiped out. I mean, I'm talking about the possibility of the nation of China being totally eradicated. After all, China is quite a threat to the United States of America. Many people think that our star is in decline and the star of China is rising. Well, there are many people in America that don't want to listen to that. We don't like the idea of a Marxist dictatorship being the most powerful force on earth and reshaping the world in its image. So could we, under some kind of a provocation, start pushing those buttons and wipe out the entire nation of China? After all, we owe them, what, $1.7 trillion? They threatened to bankrupt us. But if we wipe the whole nation out, how much would we owe them? There's no one to owe. It all goes away. Now, should we think like that? Certainly not. It's horrific to think like that. But are there people in power capable of thinking that way? 
you better believe there are. I mean, go back. World War I, 8.2 million dead. World War II, 52 million. And the same evil lurks in the heart of men today. They think they're right. They think their cause is right. And do they have the ability to do it? Yes, they do. How do I know? Because the Bible says they're going to do it. I'm not telling you this is something that may happen. This is going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. There is not any chance it's not going to happen because it's in your Bible. It's prophesied. And the prophecies always come to pass. You know, really, there's only one place of safety, and that's in Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit more later on, but you need to be thinking about that because where can you go to hide? We don't know the answer to that, but there is a place of safety. Okay, now what's the world going to look like the day after? I mean, here you've got one third of the world's population dead, gone. Many of them never to be seen again, vaporized by the intense heat of nuclear exchanges. Others die in a slow, agonizing death from nuclear radiation. The world Everything is upside down. Nobody knows where to turn. The structures of the world are shaken. And the United States will probably be regarded as a pariah nation because we'll probably be responsible for most of the fatalities. So what's the world going to look like? Well, believe it or not, there's a prophecy in the Bible that tells us it's Revelation chapter number 13. And there we read about the one world government. And this passage is three and a half years before Armageddon. So this passage is after this war. This war has got to be over, remember, before the Great Tribulation begins. And this, the Great Tribulation begins three and a half years before Armageddon. This scripture is three and one half years before Armageddon. Let's take a look at it. This is Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. It's a prophecy about the one world government of the Antichrist and about the Antichrist himself. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, that's Satan, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after this beast. The whole world is going to follow this beast. Now what in the world is this? We've learned before now that a beast in Bible prophecy always represents a nation. Multiple heads on a beast represent the number of times that nation will rise and fall. Now remember back in Daniel 7, if you've ever been back there for that lesson, there were four beasts. There was a lion representing Great Britain. There was a bear representing Russia. There was an eagle representing the United States. There was a leopard representing Germany. And there was a ten-horned beast representing the revived Holy Roman Empire, the countries of Europe. Now, they were four separate beasts back in Daniel 7. When we move from Daniel 7 to Revelation 13, look at the components here. You can see a picture of the beast here. Body of the leopard, feet of the bear, mouth of the lion, but all seven heads are there because there was a total of seven heads back in Daniel 7. So this prophecy that was given uh, way back in 550 B.C. in the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation was written in about 95, 96 A.D. So 650 years later, we have the book of Revelation. That's a long time between writings, right? And yet the exact same symbols are used only they're being used in a different way. Now, when you look at these symbols and the way they're being used, notice it has the body of the leopard, that's Germany, the feet of the bear is Russia, the mouth of the lion, Great Britain. So Great Britain, Germany, Russia, they're going to be integral parts of this one world governmental system. And then the ten horned beast is there, the revival of the Holy Roman Empire. But remember those eagle's wings back there in Daniel 7? No eagle's wings here. What does that mean? Does that mean we've been wiped off the map? Or does that mean we've gone into isolation? What does it mean? There's no United States of America. You say, oh, that scares me. It shouldn't. That's good news. 
because if you're included in this conglomerate beast, you're under the reign of the Antichrist. So what's the odds that maybe we've gone into uh, solitary confinement? Maybe we've withdrawn. Maybe the prophecies of the Bible have gotten all the way to the White House. And maybe the rulers we have by then understand what the prophecies say and have decided to retreat from world affairs and perhaps will play a different role during this time. Could we be wiped out? Yes, we probably could. But there's some reasons to believe that we probably will not. Okay, so now let's ask a very important question. What will happen to the nation of Israel? We know that Israel's going to survive because she's going to build her th third temple on the Temple Mount. And we also know that Israel, in the wake of this horrific war with 2.2 billion dead, Israel is going to resume animal sacrifices. That means there's somewhat of a religious revival taking place in the nation of Israel. Now, all of these things have to be completed actually before the Antichrist assumes total global power. So in the wake of this war, Israel's experiencing, we've got to build our temple. There, there's got to be peace on earth. Israel believes the key to peace on earth is to rebuild the temple and for the Messiah to come back. So they're going to build their temple. We know it's going to be done before the final three and a half years, before the Antichrist actually is recognized and assumes power. So we know that about the nation of Israel. The other thing we want to ask is, who will make up the 2.2 billion that will be killed? Could it be Islam? Uh, there's a pretty good chance it will be because the Islamic world controls the Euphrates River and that's where this war actually comes from. And furthermore, in the new world order, there's going to be one world political system and one world religious system. Is Islam willing to compromise? Islam is a real strong religion. Would they be willing to go into a one world religious system? Maybe they will. I don't know. Because false religion, and Islam is a false religion, is always willing to compromise. They don't stick with the truth. They go with whatever is expedient and best for them. However, knowing Islam like I do, I have a feeling that Islam is never going to be willing to totally blend in. So it could be that Islam has been pretty well wiped out. we got 2.2 billion people here. Now, what about China? Well, China is not depicted in the prophecies of the Bible. The dragon in Revelation 13 is very specifically referring to Satan himself as giving power to this one world governmental system. What about Revelation 16? A lot of people think the kings of the east in the Armageddon prophecy when the Euphrates River drives up and the kings of the east come down to make war against Israel that maybe that's China. But that's not referring to China because those kings are specifically named over in uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 that they're going to come from the east across the Euphrates River and it names them. It names Meshach, which is the uh, original word for Moscow. It's Russia. It names Iran. Persia, Libya, Ethiopia. So this is a coalition of nations under a UN flag that's going to come down against Israel. It's not referring to China. So what's the chances that China could be wiped out? I think they're relatively high because you've got 1.3 billion. Even if China's wiped out, you've still got another 900 million that have to die in order for one-third of the world's population to be wiped out. Now, what else is going to happen after this war? We know that the center for world power is going to swing to Europe because we saw the beast. It's got the body of the leopard, Germany, the feet of the bear, Russia, the mouth of the lion, Great Britain. It's got the ten-horned kingdom, which is made up of Europe, the revival of the Holy Roman Empire. So the center of world power is going to swing to the European Union and the Euro. And furthermore, this peace agreement will then quickly be made and so the world's going to think, oh, finally, peace. With this horrible catastrophe, there's going to be an upswing of religious fervor. The Bible teaches that a very strong religious leader will arise and he will make coalition with the Antichrist himself. The Bible calls this religious leader the false prophet. And he will lead most of Christianity. The Bible is very clear that apostate Christianity, I'm talking about Christians who say, well, doctrine doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't really matter what you believe. And so it's going to make be easy for them to 
rejoin themselves with Roman Catholicism. Most of Christianity will become one again. And they're going to follow the leadership of Roman Catholicism into this agreement with the one world leader of the world, the Antichrist. And there will be a world religion, there will be a world political system working together. And most likely, Islam is either going to compromise itself and join this, or else Islam is going to be destroyed during this war. Now, we also know that this war undoubtedly is going to serve as the entrance ramp for the Antichrist to come to power. Politics and religion will form this alliance. It's very clearly depicted in Revelation chapter number 13. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church will be the strongest religion on earth, but the Protestants are going to cooperate with her. They're all going to be moving back to this religion of convenience. And religious zeal is going to be blamed for this war. And anyone who's not a member of a mainstream religion, well, they will be outlawed as religious terrorists or religious extremists. The Bible says they will be persecuted for his name's sake. The people who say, no, you must be a Christian in order to be saved, uh, you're going to become part of the uh, avoided, persecuted group, even though the Bible teaches that. Jesus said, except you believe I'm the Messiah, you'll die in your sins. And yet the Bible states that if we are not willing to compromise and say, look, all religions are okay, Muslims are okay, Jews are okay, Buddhist, everything is, if it's good for you, it's good for me. It's that kind of thinking. If you're unwilling to bow the knee to that, then you become part of the persecuted group and religious inclusiveness will be mandated. They're already talking about it. Already, if you try to proselytize people in some of the European countries today, you can go to prison because they're saying we can no longer allow religious conflict. We must now have religious inclusiveness. And that's going to be the belief system of the one world government and the one world religion of the new world order. And the mark of the beast will be implemented. The mark of the beast will be forced upon the human race so that you will have to obey the edicts of the Antichrist. Now, what happens to America? We only see the eagle one other time in the scriptures. In Revelation 12, verse 13, the Bible says the Antichrist will make war against the woman Israel. She has 12 stars around her head. And when that happens, this is verse number 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place. Where is Israel's place? It's the promised land. It's the land promised to Abraham. And we know Israel's going to stay there safely until the battle of Armageddon because that's the reason the Antichrist invades Israel to Armageddon is because she's been there not under his power. Well, who is Israel's only friend? The eagle. We have used our veto power at the United Nations to protect Israel for the last 60 years so far. It appears that the reason the eagle's wings are not on the one world governmental system is because we backed off. Israel is not going to be invaded by the Antichrist. The United States, it looks like, if we're not wiped out, then it looks like we're not a key player in the one world governmental system. You say, well, that's terrible. No, it's not terrible. It's wonderful. We should not want to be a part of this one world governmental system. Is it possible? that America could be in opposition to the Antichrist. A lot of people say the whole world is going to follow the Antichrist, and that's true generally. But yet we have scriptures here in Daniel chapter 11 that explicitly say that there will be those who resist the Antichrist. In verse number 32, it says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he the Antichrist corrupt by flatteries, but they that understand them among the people shall instruct many. So right in the middle of this chaos, after the abomination of desolation, during the final three and a half years, they that understand among the people are going to be in full evangelism mode. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. There are people who will die. There's always been people who will die. Eleven of the first twelve apostles were killed for the name of Jesus because they wouldn't quit preaching. So since America is not specifically included in the one world government, could it be could it be 
that the U.S. would become a center for world evangelism. Now, also in Daniel chapter number 11, verse 40, it says, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him the, the Antichrist, and the king of the north, who is the Antichrist, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, probably the West Bank, Judea, which will be under the control of the Palestinians. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the chief of Ammon. Edom is southern Jordan. The Moab Mountains are in central Jordan. And Ammon is Ammon, Jordan. So Jordan will never be occupied by the Antichrist. Israel will never be occupied by the Antichrist, or else the Antichrist would not have to invade Israel and Armageddon. Could America also escape? Don't know the answer to that. All we know is verse 44 of chapter 11 says, But tidings out of the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away. He's going, the Antichrist is going to have opposition on a national level during the final three and a half years. I, for one, certainly hope it's the United States of America. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Okay, World War III. It's going to happen. One third of mankind is going to die. So where is safety? There's only one place. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. The Bible says except a person is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Your only hope, my only hope, we have to know where we stand with Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to say to all of you out there today. Don't play Russian roulette with your soul. Get in God's Word. Enroll in some Bible studies. Figure out what, what is going on. Go through understanding the end time level one. Learn the prophecies because it's coming. One third of this world is getting ready to be wiped out. But it doesn't matter whether you are or not. If you're ready, you have eternal life one way or the other.